We are talking today with Dr. Jill Stein. Dr. Jill Stein is a physician, environmental health advocate, and former teacher of internal medicine. She is the co-author of two reports, In Harm's Way, Toxic Threats to Child Development, published in 2000, and Environmental Threats to Healthy Aging, published in 2009. She ran for governor of Massachusetts in 2002 on the Green Rainbow Party ticket, and again on the Green Rainbow Party ticket for Massachusetts State Representative in 2004 and for Massachusetts Secretary of State in 2006, a race in which she won the votes of over 350,000 Massachusetts citizens, which represented the greatest vote total ever for a Green Rainbow candidate. She is co-founder of the Massachusetts Coalition for Healthy Communities, previously served on the boards of the Greater Boston Physicians for Social Responsibility and Mass Voters for Fair Elections. And she is also a member of the Massachusetts Medical Society and Physicians for a National Health Plan. And she is the Green Party candidate for President of the United States in 2012. Jill Stein, thank you very much for coming and spending time with us this morning. It's great to be with you, Mike. Thanks so much for having me. So start out and tell us what was your motivation in uh, running for president of the United States? Well, actually, what got me into the race was learning a year ago that the president uh, put Medicare and Social Security on the chopping block as part of how we would solve the debt ceiling crisis, that we would make big cuts to these programs. And at that point, I kind of went ballistic, like a lot of other people did, and said, oh, my God, you know, you've got the Democrats and the Republicans now both going after Social Security and Medicare. And in fact, this was the Democrats opening the door to the attack uh, in this context of, you know, the debt ceiling crisis. And at that point, I got religion for the first time about national politics. I had never been involved, had always worked at the local and state level because that's where grassroots democracy grows and that's where we build from. So that's where I've always put my energies and never actually was connected with the national party uh, or national political fights for that matter. So I became involved with the National Green Party and suddenly really appreciated that there were people out there who had ensured over the course of you know, the past 10 or 15 years that the Green Party had a national voice and a national structure, which I had nothing to do with, but suddenly I appreciated why they had hung in there. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, so I became involved at that point to try to help find a candidate to ensure that we would have a voice and that uh, we wouldn't let this attack on our fundamental social infrastructure go without a challenge in this presidential race, which is what we were looking at. Agreement among the uh, establishment parties on this issue, like on so many others, but this just seemed too shocking you know, to just uh, let it go unchallenged. So I became involved in that search and in the process got recruited. Somewhat kicking and screaming, but as I got into it, you know, as I sort of agreed to do it, I found that, oh my God, this was different from any other race I had run. I really expected this to be much more bitter and contested and kind of an angry, angry race. Um, I've always experienced that running as a third party candidate, even in local and state races, and thought that this would be, you know, sort of that bitterness on steroids. But I found it was exactly the opposite. In fact, it was like giving out candy. It still is like giving out candy at Christmas or Kwanzaa or Hanukkah or whatever you want. That. It's just um, I'm constantly uh, overwhelmed with gratitude and wild enthusiasm that people actually have a voice and that they have a choice in this election that's not bought and paid for by Wall Street. So starting from the very beginning, right on up through, it's been a really wonderful and exciting experience to empower voters who are really in a revolt right now. We know that from polls. We know that from declining registrations by the millions in the Democratic and Republican parties. We know it from the single-digit approval rates for, uh, for Congress. People aren't happy with what they're getting, and it's really different from before. The problems have always been there, but now suddenly everybody and their mother and their kids are in the crosshairs, and we're all um, 
really paying the price for this hijacked political system. So there is enormous political will out there to really change our direction. So it's been an extremely uh, exciting experience. The two-party system we have here in the U.S., though, doesn't really, al although there are third parties, doesn't really allow them to participate. Can you talk about that a bit? Yeah, and, you know, we are... Uh, we're disadvantaged as voters in the same way that we are disadvantaged as members of our economy and our community. And just expanding on, on the previous comments, I, I should mention, you know, the, the breadth of the crisis that we are facing, that people continue to lose their jobs, unemployment rate continues to climb, wages continue to fall, uh, millions of homeowners have been thrown out of their homes by the banks who are making out like bandits and whom we have bailed out to the tune you know of trillions of dollars actually has been spent bailing out wall street but they still continue to throw us out on the street um, we are you know uh, looking at skyrocketing costs of health care public higher education we've turned a generation into indentured servants trying to pay their college loans they don't have jobs to pay them back with our civil liberties are under attack and the climate is in meltdown yet the rich continue to get richer and the political establishment is making it worse imposing austerity on everyday people while they continue to squander trillions of dollars on wars Wall Street bailouts and tax breaks for the wealthy you know so what's wrong with this picture everything is wrong with this picture especially the fact that we can fix every one of these problems this isn't rocket science we can create jobs uh, you know through a Green New Deal like we did during the, the Great Depression we can create the jobs that transition the economy to a green economy that put a halt to climate change that make wars for oil obsolete we can downsize the military budget and put hundreds of billions of dollars back into our needs here at home provide health care as a human right through Medicare for all which actually saves us money uh, while it puts you back in charge of your health care decisions instead of some profiteering CEO and provides complete coverage make public higher education free as it should be as it was intended to be uh, and as well bail out the students we found a way to bail out the bankers who caused the problem we can certainly do it for the students uh, and uh, create a welcoming path to uh, to uh, legal citizenship for the immigrant members of our community and economies who are key parts of that you know the society we live in and we can fix the problem that drove this wave of uh, economic migration into our country, which is hard on everybody involved. It's hard on those who f are forced to migrate. It's hard on the communities they leave behind and their families. And it's, it's hard on the receiving end as well. So, you know, we can fix that by fixing NAFTA, which essentially drove millions of poor farmers in particular out of business and out of a livelihood and forced them to come here. Uh, you know, to support their families. So this is a fixable problem. And besides, uh, immigrants are being demonized for what are really, uh, you know, a waste, fraud, and abuse caused by Wall Street, which really crashed the economy. This is not a problem of immigrants stealing our jobs, but rather uh, serving in critical areas that, you know, Americans are just not capable of doing. You know, we don't have the background, we don't have the knowledge, et cetera, especially the farm work. Um, and all sorts of jobs that, that immigrants fill and make an enormous contribution to our economy. So at any rate, you know, we can fix this. We don't have to, um, you know, we don't have to go over the cliff here, which is that both political parties are, that's where they're taking us, and they're telling us that we don't have a choice. And, you know, they don't want people to have a choice, not on these issues. They don't want us to implement the real solutions that are out there. And so they restrict our choices uh, politically. And, you know, back to your question, what do third parties face? Third parties face the same steep, uphill, undemocratic, um, you know, hurdles that everyday people face. You know, when people say to me, well, don't you think it's hopeless? You know, my response to that is, well, you know, to concede that it's hopeless for us to have a voice, you know, is to say that, well, it's hopeless that we're ever going to have jobs. You know, it's hopeless that we're going to stop these, these uh, draconian trade agreements that ship our jobs overseas and undermine our wages here, you know, th that it's hopeless that, that our students can afford an education and actually have a life uh, n not being indentured servants. Is it hopeless that we're going to fix the climate crisis? You know, uh, anybody who is a mother, a father, a sister, a brother, 
a son or a daughter, you know, we just don't give up. You know, you don't throw out your future and your family's future like that. We got to stick it out and fight it out, especially because we now have the power. <laughs> you know, uh, in poll after poll, the American public is in agreement with what our campaign is promoting as the only public interest campaign in this race. We've actually won, you know, in the court of public opinion if democracy had anything to do with it. These are the solutions that people are clamoring for. As Alice Walker says, the biggest way people give up power is by not knowing they have it to start with. We got it, and our campaign is in this race to help, um, to help people understand that power and to... Um, uh, to help people transition from this politics of fear that's been drummed into us for the past, uh, you know, certainly last decade. It goes well, you know, beyond that uh, historically. But since the, you know, Nader Bush Gore, it's really been drummed into people and people who are community minded and progressive thinking that you don't dare stand up for what you believe. And in fact, it's exactly the opposite because this politics of fear that's told us to be quiet has actually delivered everything we were afraid of, the expanding wars, the meltdown of the climate, the, um, you know, the collapse of our economy, the offshoring of our jobs. We've gotten all of this in by the droves because we've been quiet. And what really moves our democracy forward more than anything else, you know, is uh, the vision, the agenda, and the demands of the social movement. And the social movement is out there alive and well saying that we need a democratic uh, political process and we need a democratic uh, economy as well that actually serves people, not just the banks. So how many states uh, is the Green Party uh, uh, on the ticket? We are currently on, I believe it's 33 or 34, but we are on track right now for at least 40, maybe as many as 45. And we already have secured ballot lines in all of the big states. So we're on, you know, in New York and Texas and um, California, Illinois, Pennsylvania, you name it, all the really high population states were already on. So at this point, we're looking at least 90% of voters who will walk into the voting booth and have a real choice, and hopefully it'll be 95%, maybe even more. Uh, talk more about the uh, Green New Deal. Uh, if you can give us some specifics on that, maybe starting with, with jobs, since uh, the media likes to focus on that so much. Yeah, yeah, great. So the Green New Deal is a, uh, it's an emergency program to basically solve two crises that are getting worse and which are basically being ignored by the political establishment. That is the crisis in jobs and the crisis in the climate. And the good news is that we can solve them both at once. And the Green New Deal does that by creating 25 million jobs, jobs to put everybody back to work who needs a job who's unemployed or who doesn't have full-time work. And these are good-paying, living-wage jobs that are community-based. Uh, and in doing so, it jump-starts the green economy that we need for the future. Excuse me. <clears throat> Um, and that green economy makes wars for oil obsolete, and it also puts a halt to climate change. And it's basically modeled after the New Deal that got us substantially out of the Great Depression. So this isn't an academic idea or a hypothetical. It's something that's actually been tried, and it works. We know how to do it. It means creating jobs directly, not simply providing tax breaks for corporations, which is what the President and Congress did in the 2009 stimulus package, which was in majority tax breaks for corporations. Now that doesn't create jobs, and the jobs that it does create then wind up having an enormous price tag on them. So for basically the same cost as the 2009 stimulus package, around $700 billion roughly, we could jumpstart this program of creating 25 million jobs, putting everyone back to work. And the Green New Deal puts communities in charge of deciding what kinds of jobs they need to become sustainable, not just environmentally, but also socially and economically. So it creates jobs, for example, in the typical green areas of the economy, in clean manufacturing, local organic agriculture, clean renewable energy and conservation, and in public transportation, including a component of what we call recreational 
transportation so that you have a system of bike paths and safe sidewalks that are integrated with public transit so you can ride your bike to the to the transit station and get on the the train or the bus and take your bike with you or have it safely uh, secured there and a bike on the other end that you can pick up. You know, that kind of a transit system ensures that we integrate activity into our daily lives. It's not something we have to go out and purchase an expensive uh, health club pass for um, and take hours out of our day in order to get some activity. Activity should be built into the structure of uh, of our communities. So we call the Green New Deal in some ways a real health care system because it creates the infrastructure for health. You know, right now we have not a health care system, we have a sick care system that costs us over two trillion dollars a year and 75 percent of those costs are spent um, treating chronic illnesses that are preventable at a tiny fraction. Of, of the cost. And the Green New Deal does that by making healthy local food available and affordable. And that means fresh food, which is truly the healthiest kind of food that has sort of dropped out of our food supply for the most part, but which is beginning to come back. It's thriving even with the, the tables tilted against it. So we want to tilt the tables in favor of it so that everybody has access to clean, healthy food, to recreation as part of our transit system, to pollution prevention, because we know that air pollution, not to mention all the other kinds, water and uh, food and consumer products, air pollution alone we know is a huge driver of so much of our chronic health, public health problems, heart disease, stroke, uh, dementia and cognitive decline. Um, a whole slew of problems are increasingly related to air pollution. So simply preventing that kind of pollution by moving to clean green energy uh, helps create this infrastructure for health, which is part of the win-win of the Green New Deal. It not only creates the jobs, it also, um, you know, it jumpstarts the green economy that thereby makes climate change, uh, brings it to a halt, really. And because we have transferred, then, our energy sources from oil abroad to clean, renewable energy here at home, we don't need this trillion dollar a year military industrial security budget, you know, we could do far better and be far more secure in all kinds of ways by cutting that bloated budget down to size where it ought to be at about half the size that it is now and bring hundreds of billions of dollars back into our economy. I should mention also that with these jobs in the Green New Deal, um, it also uh, you know, it also subsidizes and jump starts the jobs we need socially. So we can hire back those 300,000 teachers who've been laid off as part of the austerity economy since the uh, since the crash of the economy in 2008. Uh, we can hire child care after school. Um, uh, violence and drug abuse prevention and rehabilitation, as well as affordable housing construction. We have more homeless people in this country. I'm sorry, we have more homes that are vacant and abandoned in this country than we have homeless people. This is just, you know, a crime. This is staggering that we allow this to continue. So the Green New Deal essentially puts our resources back at the disposal of the public and solves the critical emergencies that are driving us over the cliff right now. And these are problems for which the political establishment, Mitt Romney and Barack Obama, they do not have an exit strategy uh, on these problems at all. It's just staggering. They have nothing except more of what got us into this mess to start with. So these are the solutions that the American public is clamoring for. One other thing I should mention quickly is that the Green New Deal also includes health care as a human right through Medicare for All, and it includes uh, a moratorium on home foreclosures and requiring the banks to sit down and negotiate to keep families in their homes, including lowering the principal so that families can stay where they are and stabilize their communities. And it also includes uh, creating a system of public higher, trans uh, higher education, which is in fact free and includes forgiveness of student debt. It seems that currently that uh, the U.S. economy is so integrated into our military um, yeah. 
you know, that's that's worldwide now, you know, hundreds of bases and countries all over the world. So how do you anticipate uh, ratcheting that down? I mean, there'll be resistance from people that are have a very good paying jobs at these different uh, military, military industrial uh, corporations. Exactly, which is why it's so important, I think, to integrate this into part of a larger plan that ensures that everybody has a job. And in fact, the jobs we're talking about are jobs that make us stronger, more sustainable, that make our communities healthy, and that are healthy for the workers who are, you know, who are part of that, that job. So, you know, it is a win-win. It's a very hard sell, you know, to tell people that uh, we're putting you out of a job and we have nowhere for you to go. You know, and it's no surprise that people really dig in their heels and they will cling, you know, for dear life to their current job. That's why we think this is the time to make that transition because it is an incredible wake-up moment, you know, that people see, number one, our foreign policy has really gotten us into trouble, bigger trouble all the time. You know, we're just seeing Iraq and Afghanistan continue to fall apart at the seams, you know, with record record killings and suicide bombs and, uh, you know, just the loss of life is staggering. And it's clear, you know, after trillions of dollars in Iraq and hundreds of thousands of lives lost, including many thousand Americans and many, many more who've been wounded and, and disabled for life, you know, we haven't solved problems there. We haven't created a democracy. We haven't created a reliable ally. We had to withdraw from Iraq in the dead of night on a secret, undisclosed date so that we wouldn't be ambushed in the withdrawal. You know, we're being we're being attacked by our supposed allies in Afghanistan with whom you know, with whom our soldiers are serving. Uh, we're not winning friends here. We're not winning the hearts and minds of the world and the countries that we're uh, sending our military into, including our drones, where we are busy bombing funerals and weddings, you know, and, and just creating civilian casualties that are, are uh, you know, are driving our former allies into the hands of, you know, our, our devout um, opponents. You know, this is a very counterproductive strategy. People are waking up to that right now. You know, the public says by about 70 percent they want to bring the troops home now from Afghanistan. So there's enormous public support for revisiting our military budget. The public, despite the, the incredible propaganda uh, campaign on behalf of the military. Even so, the public in large majority supports downsizing the military budget. And most of the public has no clue how really big the military budget is, especially when you include all these security measures that are now imposed on us here at home as they begin to, uh, you know, bring the drones home too to spy on us as well. So, you know, these are not popular programs and the American public is clamoring to put them on the shelf and put our money to work here. Likewise, people are you know, really getting what an emergency the climate is. So this is a great time for us to be putting this kind of converging solution on the table that ensures that people will have jobs as we transition to an economy uh, and a security policy that will actually protect our lives and ensure that our children have a future and a climate they can live in and resources uh, to put into our schools and our jobs and all the rest. It's a really, people are at the breaking point in so many ways. It's a great time to be advancing solutions that turn the breaking point into a tipping point to take back the kind of peaceful, just, green future we deserve. How do you anticipate uh, dealing with large corporations that appear to be uh, <laughs> pulling the strings in most of the situations today? That's a really, you know, important point, and thank you for raising that. I think there are there's sort of a double strategy which is needed. So we need an immediate strategy to break through the wall of propaganda and political control that corporations have right now, both in order to win office or if not to win office, to win the day by building a political vehicle for the long haul that can begin to revive our democracy and advance these solutions. So there's an immediate strategy for breaking through, and then there's a series of reforms that would fix this problem, you know, in, in the blink of an eye. So first, just immediately, 
it's really important, you know, I think, above all, for us to reject the propaganda that we can't do it. Because that, above all, is their biggest tool for constraining us. It's this, you know, it's this uh, sense of our own disempowerment, which we hear about all the time. You know, that, oh, isn't it too bad there's not political will to bring the troops home? You know, well, hello, there is political will. You know, it's just that our, our political establishment is entirely disconnected from that political will. So how do we get from here to there? I think it's really important to think about, you know, Tunisia and Tahrir Square and our right to a Tahrir moment, you know. In Egypt, people were completely, uh, you know, unaware that there was a revolution in the making right up till the day before. No one in their right mind would have dreamed that in three weeks they could essentially, you know, turn an entrenched dictator with all the power of the military who'd been there for 40 years, that they could just, you know, send him running, which is what they did in three weeks of coming out on the street. And we have many of the makings of that kind of a social and political revolution. In fact, it's already happening. You know, that's what Occupy is about. It's what the fight against student debt, the fight against foreclosures, uh, against the big powerful banks. You know, that social movement is alive and well. And what we're doing is giving it uh, an electoral voice as well. Not saying that the electoral movement displaces the social movement. They have to work together. And the social movement is really the engine. But Throughout history, it's that combination of a social movement and uh, and a political independent party that really makes history together. So the short term is basically networking. It's about getting the word out. I encourage people to go to our website, which is just my name, jillstein.org. That's Jill, S-T-E-I-N, dot O-R-G. Sign up to be a volunteer and sign up for the newsletter, and you'll be on the pipeline for you know, for the strategies uh, that are, uh, that will soon be uh, unleashed for moving us towards that Tahrir moment. And once in office, let me just say that if I'm not holding my breath, but on the other hand, I'm not counting it out <laughs> either. Uh, as Chris Hedges says, and he, he has, you know, as the New York Times uh, war correspondent, he was present at many revolutions. And he said, Right up until the day they happen, people are completely unaware that they're going to happen. On the day that the uh, wall came down uh, in East Berlin, people were saying on that day, maybe in 10 years, they could really have substantive change. So I'd say don't rule anything out and don't discount uh, the power of this moment that we're in. It really is a transformational moment. Um, so if we... Uh, actually one office and we're able to turn the White House into a greenhouse, you know, that would be a really cool thing. The world would be better off for it. Um, and if that were to happen, you know, the question is, well, how would you move any of these solutions forward? Like campaign finance reform, public funding, opening up the airwaves so that the public and public interest candidates actually have equal access to airtime, and then the money goes out of politics, basically. It's still there. You know, the, the backroom deals will go on, but suddenly they don't have an advantage anymore if there's equal airtime. Um, you know, passing a constitutional amendment to get, uh, get our, our rights of personhood back from corporations who stole them. You know, the move to amend, for example, amendment that would clarify money is not speech and corporations are not persons. You know, there are many good solutions. They're not rocket science. These are just basic common sense that can be passed. But how would we pass them? So in brief, I just want to mention that the president can be not just the commander in chief but the president can also be the organizer-in-chief and ensure that people know what's coming up, when it's coming up. Here's some key talking points. Now go to it. Let your senators, your congressmen and women know why you support this bill and why they must support this bill if they expect to be reelected uh, next election or not recalled before then. This is what we did on the SOPA bill the Stop Online Piracy Act, which was considered a slam dunk. When word got out, it was stopped. That should be the rule and not the exception. The public should be in the driver's seat. This is a democracy, supposedly. Let's make it so by instructing our elected officials how, they, how we want them to vote on critical issues as they come up. The president could be on prime time, could have, you know, uh, the, 
her own uh, moveon.org that actually moves on from the Democratic Party, but, you know, uses that terrific, um, uh, uh, you know, means, that, that wonderful device of actually informing people in a concise email how they can weigh in and we can be the driver of policy and the president can be a whistleblower on Congress so that people actually... Uh, get to see what's going on in our government. We have a right to know and to be the engine of that government. And perhaps actually protect whistleblowers instead of prosecute them. <laughs> exactly. Unfortunately, we are uh, pretty much out of time. We are talking with Dr. Jill Stein. She is the 2012 Green Party candidate for President of the United States. And again, Jill, how can people find out more about your campaign? So please go to jillstein.org. Um, sign up, uh, network on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, get our email newsletter and forward it because... There is a voter revolt out there that's alive and well. We just need to give it something to vote for uh, to empower us to take our future back. So go to jillstein.org and join the team. Thanks so much. All right. Well, I want to thank you very much for spending time with us today. It was great talking with you, Mike. Thanks so much for having me.